My name is International Master William Pascal, and today I'm going to present part two of my series on the fundamentals of isolated queen pawn positions. In part one, we saw a game which was more or less ideal for the side with the isolated queen pawn. In most examples, I would say 75% of the examples, we're going to see positions where white has the isolated queen pawn, and white is trying to do the attacking procedure. In about a quarter of examples, situations are reversed, and black has the isolated queen pawn, and he is actually trying to take the initiative, play for the attack in the middle game. This is one of those situations. The game is one of my favorite players, Salo Flor, playing the white pieces against Vidmar, Slovenian master, who was also featured in part one of our series. And this game was played in Nottingham 1936, a very famous tournament. Both players were some of the strongest players of their generation. Of course, Floor, a class above Vidmar overall. Um, Floor was one of the most elite players in the world during that period. So we're going to see this opening and then talk about what's really happening here. Isolated queen pawn positions can even arise from king pawn openings. That what's make, that's what really makes it so important to understand. No matter what opening you play, there's a chance you can get into isolated queen pawn positions. And you really should understand them from both sides. So today we're going to see a little bit of how one should handle playing against the isolated queen pawn. D4, D5. Floor was an excellent queen pawn player. C4, E6, queen's gambit declined. Knight to C3, knight to F6, and bishop to G5. This move was popularized by, of course, Alekhin and Capablanca, and um, Floor also adhering to the principle of uh, continuation. Modern chess is bringing more interest to knight F3 followed by bishop F4. And also, of course, the exchange variation, as I mentioned in our first installment of this lecture series on the fundamentals of the isolated queen pawn positions. Now, after bishop g5, we see the classical bishop e7, e3, castles. Just a little side note, in many variations it's useful to throw in the move h6, when most often white retreats to h4, although sometimes bishop takes f6, is played. I recommend bishop h4. h6 can lead to the Tartikova variation and the Lasker variation, both of which are very, very tough to crack. In any case, back in those days, these variations weren't considered the main line. This is 1936, black castles, knight to f3, and knight on b to d7. And this is like our first game of the lecture series that Budvinik played against Vidmar. Same player, same defense, no surprise there. And here Floor played a move that's attributed to Akiba Rubinstein, another player, one of the strongest players in the history of chess, especially strong in queen pawn openings, queen c2, Rubinstein's move. Now this move, I think, is one of the most active, maybe the most active move, because white has options to castle long and play very sharply in variations after queen c2. So basically, black has two options here, two main options. I've seen people play b6, but there's danger along the c-file to c7. Generally, c6 is considered to be kind of inferior. So the only major moves after queen to c2 are c6, which is generally considered to be a little bit passive, and the active move played in the game, c5, which was and is still considered to be the way to play against queen c2. So this move is, I think, primarily aimed at disturbing any kind of very aggressive plans by white, including castling queenside. If white tries to castle queenside, which he can here, the game becomes very double-edged because the white king does not have that much protection as the center is blown open. All this tension 
in the center will lead to a quick opening of the position, and sometimes the white king has to be careful if he's castled on the queen side. So, white played the safer continuation, which was popular then. C takes d5. This still very well may be the best move. Um, I've used other moves like rook to d1 sometimes, not committing to castling queen, but staying active along the central file. Also an interesting move. Anyway, the solid positional move, C takes D5. I know that most computer programs will agree this is the best move. And here, I want to talk a little bit about this position. Ideally, in a position where you're going to accept the isolated queen pawn, you want your pieces to be placed as actively as possible. Another principle that you want to kind of adhere to when you're playing against the isolated queen pawn is that you want to keep as many pieces as possible on the board. So there's several things that you want to try to avoid when you're playing against the isolated queen pawn, or sorry, with the isolated queen pawn. What you want to try to do is avoid exchanges and make sure your pieces are able to come out very actively, and that's usually your compensation. If the black knight was on c6 instead of d7, I would say he would be more justified in capturing with the pawn on d5. Then we would have a kind of tarash queen's gambit declined. But with a knight on d7, the move e takes d5 does not look so good. In one way, it makes sense, but the black knight on d7 is so badly placed in the way of the bishop on c8, black has this weak pawn on d5, not yet isolated, but likely to become isolated should this exchange occur either way, c takes d4 or d4 takes c5. So not the most ideal isolated queen pawn position. Black instead takes with the knight seeking simplification which is a good principal thing to do when you're black in general to seek simplification. But let's see what this results in and what it really means. So white plays bishop takes e7. Generally, when you're white, you don't want to exchange pieces, but white would have to go to some kind of extreme here to avoid exchanges like h4, and that looks a little bit too anti-positional. So the exchange is more or less forced. Bishop takes e7. Queen takes e7. Again, this is the game... Vid, Vidmar playing black against Salo Floor from Nottingham 1936, a very classic game. After bishop takes e7, queen takes e7. Now, it is conceivable to take back with a knight. Though very passive, black could avoid accepting an isolated pawn with that move. So it, it's a little bit tricky and passive, but possible. Queen takes e7 is the main move. Knight takes d5, e takes d5. And now we reach a position not with yet an isolated queen pawn, but a position where an isolated queen pawn is very likely. The only way to avoid the isolated queen pawn structure now is going to be if black plays c4 at some point. The next move for white is very active. Bishop to d3. And see, here's one of those queen's gambit situations where you're wishing that you had played h6. If we had the same position where black had played h6, there would be no threat, and black would have a useful luft move. But as it stands now, c4 is no good because the bishop takes h7 check. So after bishop d3, there's some interesting options here. I've been doing a little bit of analysis um, with the help of computers and studying over old analysis of this game to try to reach a really tight conclusion and true conclusion about what really happened in this game. Um, combining an old analysis with computers gives me a kind of uh, accurate, realistic understanding of what's going on. One interesting move was c takes d4. When it's too dangerous for white to take on h7 with check, because the bishop is constantly being threatened to be trapped. For example, bishop takes h7 check, king h8, 
electrons G6, as well as D takes E3. Some weight is simply getting involved in this active operation of bishop takes H7 check a little too early. He could play it as a kind of sacrifice. For example, knight takes D4, G6, bishop takes G6, F takes G6, queen takes G6, but moves like queen B4 check look kind of dangerous here. I think if anything, black is the only one with serious winning chances. So that's very speculative, and white avoided that. But uh, black did not play C takes D4. I think if C takes D4, white would take back simply with a knight. And if queen D4 check, queen to D2, black has a very cute move here, knight E5, with the idea of queen takes B4, knight takes D3 check, winning a piece. Well, I think floor would have just simply played bishop e2, and if white achieves the exchange of queens, he simply has a better endgame, and that's more or less all you can be happy with in this kind of position. When you're playing against the isolated queen pawn, reaching an endgame with a lot of simplification, the isolated queen pawn solidly blockaded, the square in front of the isolated queen pawn under control, Queens off the board, you're in an ideal situation. So that is an ideal situation to be in against the isolated queen pawn. This variation, therefore, would not have helped black. C takes d4. So he plays g6. And that's a tough decision, whether to play g6, h6, maybe even the interesting king h8. I like h6 because it puts one last pawn on the same color of my bishop on c8. I don't want to try to, I don't want to make my bishop too bad in the end game. And I don't want my pawns to be on the color of the enemy bishop too much in the ensuing end game. But uh, Vidmar chose to play g6, which has the concrete advantage of keeping pieces out of f5, which might be useful. Now we play d takes c5, isolating the d5 pawn. We have the important structure that is the focus of our lecture series. And now knight takes c5. A good move from Vidmar because it's important not to exchange pieces when you have the isolated queen pawn, but to play for attack, and especially to use the support points. c4, e4 are the support points here. However, Vidmar is playing a very difficult kind of isolated queen pawn position because white has already done some things that are very important. He's exchanged two sets of minor pieces. With the isolated queen pawn in this kind of position, black is supposed to play for attack. But how much realist attack, realistic attacking chances does black have with two minor pieces already off the board? So this is more like a position where Black is simply going to have to defend. After knight takes c5, white castles. Black plays actively with bishop to g4. White plays knight to d4, the ultimate outpost against the isolated queen pawn. Now the bishop on g4 is unclear whether it has a really good role in this game. It's also on the same color as most of black's pawns, if you note, which could be a huge liability. In any kind of just pure minor piece ending, the bishop is going to be a bad piece. We have knight to d4, rook on a to c8. And now, I think Fuller played a little bit too timidly. To be perfectly honest, there are no real threats for black in this position. I think he could have played something like rook to c1, for example. But he played very safely. Queen d2, getting off the file. True enough, this move has other points. It secures the e3 pawn. If white plans on playing a later f3, you'll see a very important idea in this kind of structure. That helps. White is more than happy to allow the exchange of bishop for knight. Another exchange and transposition into a pure good knight versus bad bishop position where it would take Kappa, Kappa Blanca-like technique for black to 
to defend. So after queen d2, black continues to play in the active spirit, although I don't like his next move at all, and I don't think I'll ever understand this move, a6. This move is just a complete mystery to me. It's a position where black has to try to use some initiative, generate some attacking chances, and he plays a6, a move which I don't understand. There's no threat for the white pieces to come into the b5 square, as, as far as I can tell. And uh, playing b5 simply seems like a kind of weakening for black. So I think a6 was a very weak move on Vidmar's part, just giving white some free time. And now here, I think white has many choices. Maybe f3 straight away would have been good enough. Floor himself makes a kind of slightly surprising move, but then you see the point a moment later. Bishop c2. This goes against the spirit of wanting to exchange pieces against the isolated queen pawn. But he's found a, a, a plan to try to force some exchanges by placing his bishop on b3 and putting pressure on the enemy pawn on d5. An interesting plan. Now black tries to play actively, queen g5, but it's too late for that. It's too late for Vidmar, and there's not enough pieces on the board. With a dark square bishop roaming the board on the b8, h2 diagonal, attacking plans would be wonderful. But with so few pieces on the board, this just vain attempt to play queen g5 leads to nothing. F3, a very key move, maybe the best and most important move of this game. Um, keeping the knight out of the outpost, e4. You may say, well, you're weakening the e3 pawn, and you are. But I think this kills all attacking chances for black. White defends laterally, the g2 point, in case of bishop h3. He permanently keeps the knight out of e4, which is very nice. He allows for defensive maneuvers like rook f2 to secure the g2 square even more. White is better here. Bishop back to d7. Now rook on f to e1, over protecting e3. I mean, that pawn is likely to come under attack any moment by rook on f to e8. So this is a good preemptive measure. And around this point, I would assess the position in white's favor, perhaps about a quarter of a pawn, which is all you can really ask for from the opening. I think pretty much flawless play by Floor. Some inaccuracies already by his opponent, Vidmar. And now a move which I think is very passive and strange. Rook on F to D8. It's very clear to me that in such positions with the isolated queen pawn, you have to play actively. So not put your rook behind the pawn and try to defend it passively, but put the rook on the open file. Rook attacking, counter-attacking the weakness that has been created on e3. Very important when you're playing the isolated queen pawn side of the position to play actively, not passively. So this would have been much better. I don't like the move rook on f to d8. The rook is ineffectual there. Now white played a useful move rook on a to d1, getting all the pieces in the game. And around here you can see that it's very difficult for black to come up with a plan. Black is going to have to suffer for a long time in this game. White can put pressure on the d5 pawn. And one important strategy when you're playing against the isolated queen pawn, first step is to blockade the isolated queen pawn. Now, we have it really solidly blockaded with a pawn and two major pieces and the knight, obviously. Once we've established that blockade very strongly, then often it's time to shift to attacking that pawn. So first you immobilize the pawn, then you target the pawn, and then you win the pawn. Those are the three steps when you're playing against the isolated queen pawn. Don't be in too much of a rush to try to do that. You have all the time in the world in this kind of position. So be careful when you're trying to attack that pawn that that pawn isn't able to advance. 
or you don't give up some kind of other advantage by focusing only on that one plan too much. So we see here Floor, in the next few moves, switching plans. Black with tough time. He plays Queen F6. This move is a nice little move from Vidmar putting pressure on B2. So immobilizing the knight, you see, I think that Floor wants to move that knight, for example, knight E2 and knight F4, or knight E2 and knight C3. Try to win the pawn outright. But by playing queen F6, black puts the queen on a sensible square where it's mobile, and he attacks B2. So here, after queen F6, white makes a bad move. Bishop to B3. And this might seem like a good idea, but I don't like it. And um, any computer program I've checked this game with has agreed that it's really not happy with that move. Computers are very bishop-centric and very, very strong on pawn structure. But it seems like too much of a concession to me to allow knight takes b3 and have to take back with the a pawn. Yes, white is probably still better with a strong knight, but to give up that flexibility on the queen side and have isolated pawns seems like you're losing part of your advantage. And every little bit counts in the technical endgame world. So I think this was a hasty move by Floor, and he should have been more patient. B4 looks like a really good move, driving the knight most likely to E6. And I think White could have maintained a solid advantage by playing bishop to b3 and bringing pressure on d5. Not a big advantage, but like I said, a slight advantage. All you can really hope for out of the opening against a, a strong opponent. So, we have bishop b3. Vidmar should have taken that bishop, but he was too focused on the general concept that he'll end up in the bad bishop versus knight position. But he's gotten something out of the bargain. The doubled pawns would have justified it. And I think Black's pieces are active enough, certainly active enough. I don't believe that a Capablanca would have ever lost this position after knight takes b3, a takes b. So, and Capablanca and Flora had played, <laughs> ironically enough, an isolated queen pawn game where Flora was unable to beat Capablanca. A very famous game. So, bishop a4 was the choice, and this move was lauded by some annotators as a great move, when it's ironically, I think, a very bad move. Knight takes b3 should have been the move. Bishop a4, although you are achieving a fundamental triumph in exchanging pieces, you're exchanging pieces in a way that causes white no problem. You're exchanging pieces, you're bad bishop, but exchanging pieces against Exchanging pieces with the isolated queen pawn is a bad strategy to begin with. And black achieves nothing by this. So white happily takes, bishop takes a4, knight takes a4, and we have an isolated queen pawn position that is ideal for the defending side. And now we enter the endgame stage very soon. And the closer we get to the endgame, I think the greater magnified white's advantage is. This isolated queen pawn position has kind of been a failure for black. He's traded too many pieces. Now he has to just try to grovel for a draw, which is not an easy task against the superior opponent. Um, after knight takes a4, rook to c1, of course Floor is happy to trade all the way down to the knight ending, ideally, or even more ideally perhaps a king and pawn endgame, where white could get his king to d4 would be the perfect situation. So we have rook c1 opposing the file, knight to c5, rook on e to d1, hoping, f hoping for pressure against the pawn on d5. Now here again, sometimes black can try for a counterattack, maybe shift with rook e8, I don't know. You should try to play active here, he played queen b6, and knight e2. A good moment for knight e2. White is ready to shift to knight f4 and try to win the pawn on d5 outright. Black now played knight to d7. 
and he's playing against the pawn on e3, against the pawn on b2, trying to keep white tied down. Perhaps a better way to play would have been knight to e6, which would have prevented the following maneuver. After knight e2, knight d7, Flores queen d4, and that's ideal. Knight e6 would have prevented queen d4. Now queen d4 is just an incredibly strong piece, protecting b2, protecting e3, canceling out the queen on b6, and keeping the pawn on d5 blockaded and under attack. There's simply no way that black can live and maintain attention indefinitely with a white queen on such a strong square. So the exchange on d4 is sort of unavoidable. Queen takes d4. Of course, knight takes d4. And with the queens off the board, start thinking king centralization, always in the end game. King coming to f2 will protect that weak pawn on e3 as we maintain our advantage in the end game against the isolated queen pawn. Black played knight e5, threatening invasion at c4, very serious threat. White obliges to weaken his structure slightly with b3. And black uses the same principle, king f8, good move. Always centralize the king when the queens leave the board going into the ending. White here has to be careful because king f2 allows the cheap shot knight d3 check, winning the exchange. So carefully king f1 headed for e2. Floor was an excellent all-around player, very strong in the ending. Now black exchange rooks on c1. I thought this was a little bit unnecessary. Maybe best to be patient and just bring the king to e7 first. Rook takes c1 gives up the file. Rook takes c1, rook takes c1. But even so, I have to agree with some earlier analysts of this game that black has good drawing chances. Nevertheless, white's advantage is still only a slight advantage. If he plays accurately here, Again, a Capablanca could probably hold this position with perfect defense. Black has only one real weakness, the pawn on d5. And generally speaking, it takes two weaknesses to win a game. Principle of two weaknesses. So although the rook exchange, I feel, was a little early, after king e7, I think black has excellent drawing chances here. Again, a superb endgame player like Capablanca would probably never lose this position. After rook c7 check, rook d7, I think black, with very good play, can hold the balance in this ending. And if you play this variation for black, you have to get used to this kind of thing. Um, that's the story there. I think king e7 would have been the best shot to hold the game. Instead, what we have is uh, Vidmar making an attempt to block the play on the c-file, with a tricky tactical move, knight to c6. Challenging the strong knight on d4. Obviously, white doesn't want to simplify unless he gets something out of it. He takes on c6. Bidmar's trick is rook c8, pinning. And now we have a transformation. In my earlier endgame series, I talked a lot about particularly Rubenstein's uh, ability to understand transformations in the endgame from one advantage to another. And here we have one of those. So Floor perfectly understands exchanging one advantage for another. Oftentimes in the isolated queen pawn positions, we transfer the advantage from isolated queen pawn to hanging pawn. And that's what happens here. So we have after knight takes c6, rook c8, rook c5, and white is putting pressure on the d5 pawn. If rook takes c6, rook takes d5, rook c2, for example, white will probably be able to simply move his pawn forward or to attack d7, later move the pawn forward. This is one possibility. I'm not sure. Perhaps this was a chance. 
the best chance after rook takes, in any case, would have been to play rook c2. Because after rook takes d5, rook c1 check, king e2, rook c2, rook d2, is nothing. White is winning. But I think rook c2 would have been some chance to draw. After rook c5, Vidmar played b takes c6, and this is a very unpleasant endgame, which I also, I think, featured in one of my earlier lectures on rook endgames. You might want to check that out. We're going to go through the endgame kind of more quickly, because, again, I think we featured this in another one of our lectures here on rook endgames. B takes c6, and the king centralized. King e2, king e7. Black has two weaknesses now, c6 and a6, and that might just be enough to win the game under the right circumstances. King d3, king d6. Rook a5, rook a8, only move. And now king d4, preventing the freeing move c5. White also threatens to gain space with the move e4, so black shut it down with f5. I think the play has been correct up through here. White plays b4, locking down the weaknesses on a6 and c6. Support points for the rook on a5 and c5. Rook b8, I think, kind of waste of time, in my opinion. a3, rook has to go back, because rook b6 would just be too awkward. Rook goes back to a8. And now white breaks with e4. In an attempt to create activity for his king, f takes e4, f takes e4, d takes e4, king takes e4. And now black played rook a7, which is a really mysterious move. I don't understand this move. Black has one way I think he could probably hold this position with perfect play. I'm not saying it's easy, but the only way to hold this position is to activate your rook. And rook a7 is not activating the rook. It may look cool, but it doesn't do anything to change the position. Black had to play king c7, followed by king b6. He had to protect his weak pawns with his king so his rook could go on active duty start checking and counterattacking. After king c7, I don't believe that the win is very easy and white is reduced to just a slight advantage. But instead of that, black played rook a7 without a clear plan. And now white's advantage starts to increase. King f4, threatening to invade. Now the king plan, king c7, king b6 is still possible, but every tempo helps white. King f4, h6, temporarily solving the problem, but weakening the pawns even more. Every pawn move objectively weakens those pawns even more. It may be hard to attack g6, but in, long, in the long run, it's weaker now. After h6, h4, an excellent move. And you'll see the point in a moment. King e6 going the wrong way in retrospect. King g4 threatening h5. Notice how black is just subjected to total passivity. After king g4, rook a8, total waiting move, h5. And if, if black takes, the h-pawn is left to be a fatal weakness. So black played g5. Now the h6-pawn is a target. If that pawn is lost, the white h-pawn will easily be able to promote. So white has made great progress. I think black may be very well lost in this position after this move, g5. g3, another waiting move. Always, always take your time in the ending, and Floor was very patient. Rook a7, king f3, king comes back to the center to help his rook enter the game and attack the new weakness, the second weakness, or third weakness in this case, at h6. King f3, nothing black can do, tied down to total passivity. Rook a8, king e4, rook a7. Now the winning plan is simple. Rook e5 check, king to d6, and rook e8. Two weaknesses at h6, 
and A6. And that's one weakness that uh, Vidmar could not afford. Very instructive technique. Black tries to exchange pawns with C5, and honestly, there's nothing else to recommend that's better. Even checking this with the computer, I could find no move better than C5, Rook D8 check, incredibly accurate play um, from this game back back in 1936. Of course, the end game, even back in those days, was played by certain players like Capablanca, Rubenstein, Floor, almost flawlessly. Rook D8 check, again, nothing to recommend. Nothing to recommend for black here. King C7 would be just too passive. White would simply play Rook H8 and start to win all of the pawns. King E6 would allow simply pawn take C5. He loses the pawn with King C6. Unavoidable loss of pawn. Rook C8 check. And now I think King B5 would be more active, but the position is objectively lost. King B6, too passive. Rook takes C5. White simply wins the pawn and is left with another target at H6. Rook takes C5. Rook H7. Passive defense again has no no chance of success. Remember, in the end game especially, and in chess in general, always defend actively. Passive defense is usually hopeless. Rook E5, centralizing. King C6. Rook E6 check, forcing the king. King B5, and now King F5. And obviously the king and the rook are going to siege the H6 pawn. To King F5, Rook F5 check. Rook F6. Not even allowing black to get down to attack that G3 and A3 pawn. One last accurate move, Rook F6. And Vidmar has had enough. Envisioning the loss of his H6 pawn, the G5 pawn as well. White will create two connected path pawns with the G and H pawns. The win will be beyond question. An excellent illustrative game on how to play against the isolated queen pawn. Of course, it's a little bit easier when you're white. Having a more aggressive opening stance, typically. Black really didn't get a chance to develop his pieces actively, like in some variations, like in the Tarash. His knight on d7 was kind of passive in the opening. Most importantly, the chance of a successful defense and victory against the isolated queen pawn is often secured by several early exchanges. And Vidmar allowed several exchanges of minor pieces early in the game, giving white a kind of comfortable defensive game against the isolated queen pawn. Grandmaster solid floor converting a beautiful victory here in the Sen game. I think a flawless exhibition of Grandmaster technique in the isolated queen pawn position against the isolated queen pawn in this case. We'll have more examples coming your way in future parts of this video series on the fundamentals of the isolated queen pawn positions. I'm International Master William Pascal.